happy to announce that the Fretboard Journal now has three presenting sponsors. These are three brands that are behind us with everything that we do, including the podcasts and the videos, and they include Carter Vintage, Carter Vintage Guitars, where guitar lovers go for a good time, Gibson Guitars, only a Gibson is good enough, and last but not least, Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone can't thank these three brands enough for being presenting sponsors thank you guys hey gang welcome to the fretboard journal podcast i'm jason verlindy the editor of the fretboard journal magazine and as always that's john rauhaus playing in the background you know we've been doing this podcast for a long time but it feels like in the last few months it's really hit a whole new stride we've had some of the coolest interviews we've done in our history on this very podcast and i'm going to add today's to that one because i'm talking to mac McAnally, who is one of the coolest people i've ever met i've never spoken to mac before this podcast but now i want him on the podcast all the time he is the coolest guy around he is a force of nature he is the guitarist in the jimmy buffett coral reefer band he's also played alongside and written hits for kenny chesney and Sawyer Brown. He is the CMA Musician of the Year for 10 times. He's won that award 10 times. He's also in the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame because this entire time that he's been playing with all these country legends and Jimmy Buffett, he's been writing songs and recording records on his own. And he has a new record out called Once in a Lifetime. We premiered one of the songs from it. We premiered his cover of Norwegian Wood about a month ago. I want you to all go check out this record. Uh, it is a fine record, but Mac's stories are really amazing. Mac should have a spoken word record next. Uh, before we get to that, a couple of sponsors I want to give a quick shout out to. Of course, our friends over at Mono Cases. You can go to monocreators.com to see their entire lineup of gig bags and studio monitor stands and backpacks and pedal boards and pedal board bags. Everything they do is so bulletproof and so ergonomic. I know you will love it. Also, got to give a shout out to our friends in New York City over at Retrofret Vintage Guitars. Every time I do this intro for this podcast, I go over to their new arrivals page and see what's in stock, and it always blows me away. And today I went over there, and a lot of this stuff was on hold or had just sold before I had even got a chance to hype it to you guys. So it had only been there for like four days. Uh, right now, though, they do have in stock and available a 1921 Gibson F4 Oval Hole Mandolin a 1964 Fender Princeton amp, a 1960, oh, this is so beautiful, Fender Esquire with a sunburst. And uh, if you're feeling a little blingy, the world may come to an end. Why not, right? 1959 Gibson ES350 thin line with the gold hardware. Go to retrofret.com to see their entire lineup. And by all means, tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you if you do reach out to them. Here at the Fretboard Journal headquarters in Seattle, we are hard at work prepping for our 46th issue to get done printing and mail to everybody. We're talking to Mac a little bit about his time in the studios, and during in that issue, I am talking to John Leventhal about his time in the studios, along with John's wife, Roseanne Cash. We also have stories on folk hero Linda Waterfall, archtop guitar maker Steve Grimes, and a lot more. So... If for some reason you've been listening to this podcast, but you have yet to subscribe to our magazine, now is an amazing time. We will start you off with that issue in just a couple of weeks when it is ready for you. And you can uh, go to the fretboardjournal.com website and just click on the subscribe tab and we'll hook you up. And we also have discounted digital editions now too. So if you want to just get a digital subscription and not deal with the USPS, that is totally fine by us. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of new videos on our website, new podcasts. One of, you know, I do this other podcast for the Fretboard Journal, The Truth About Vintage Amps. And uh, I know a lot of you out there probably have not given it a chance because you probably think it maybe is over your head or you're not really interested in amplifiers. But our most recent guest, Steve Melkosethian of Angela Instruments, who is making his second appearance on the podcast, is amazing. And boy, does he have stories. He was the guy going to the UK and getting container loads of vintage marshals to bring back to the States to sell. He is a guy who, uh, let's see, what other stories did he share? Selling amps to U2, the time he was a drummer for the Cramps for about 20 seconds. Uh, this guy's got some tales, so uh, go over to that podcast. Give it a listen if you haven't yet. I think you will absolutely love it. And uh, without further ado, 
here is my chat with Mac McAnally. Again, the album is called Once in a Lifetime. Go check it out. It is available now. Hey, Jason. It's Mac McAnally. How are you doing? Doing all right. How are you doing? Oh, man. I'm uh, an unusual piece of time, but I, I, I feel particularly lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's a strange time for uh, everything. Putting a record out, being around, whatever. Yes, it's true. I'm I'm in the high risk group for the virus, and I've got a I've got a daughter that's a nurse and having to get out in it every day. I, you know, I, any, anybody that gets to do music and call it a job is is blessed. But uh, but but it is uh, it is a every day has a lot of question marks over it these days. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's just get into it, um, Mac. You, I mean, normally you'd be you'd be out with Jimmy Buffett right now, probably playing a bunch of shows, right? That's that's exactly right. He's he's never not toured a summer in his adult life, you know, or his what passes for an adult life. But you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're in your seventies if you if you're wearing short pants barefooted in your own airplane, you're you're not really bound to be an adult. You can <laughs> you have the option of of adolescence, you know, extended. <laughs> sure, but uh, yes, we're we're usually on the road, and uh, and it feels funny to to not be. Uh, but by the same token, I'm a studio rat, so uh, the, the fact that I got to be a co-producer on Jimmy's album that's out, it just came out week before last, and and uh, and finished up mine right behind. It gave me plenty of stuff to do, uh, just, you know, not in the normal order in which we do things. Yeah. Well, I know the, the Coral Reefer Band is a kind of a big production. What... Where do you? What is your exact role on a on a typical tour with that band? And how many guitars are you bringing out? Or, or what are you what are you doing? Uh, you know, Jimmy and I are old songwriting buddies. We go back to to the beginning of my career and not too far into his. Uh, we I think we met in seventy seven somewhere around there, and uh, I started on the records around nineteen eighty, and then. Uh, began to to go out on the road some uh, right at the end of the eighties, early nineties, and initially I was just a songwriting buddy, sort of a rabbit's foot. We'd get up and do a couple acoustic songs in the middle of the show, but uh, I love to play. So I, the, the, at this point, I, I guess I'm a little bit of right hand man. But Michael Udley is uh, is our musical director, the keyboard player, and he's been there uh, forever. And Michael and I produce the records together but uh I, I would hesitate to say i'm indispensable because you really only need jimmy he's a great solo performer <laughs> too but there's there's 11 of us on stage and i'm just i'm proud to be one it's like a second family to me that the coral reefer whole organization is and it, it starts with jimmy who's a great guy and goes down all the way through the crew and the truck drivers and the bus drivers it's really good people yeah and what? Uh... And as far as as far as I didn't mean to circumvent oh, no, the guitar question. Yeah. Uh, my 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 main I'm I'm primarily an acoustic guitar player. I I, I have you know I, I can play parts on electric, or, but I'm not a I'm not really a confident uh, lead electric player. And I and I will say probably that more than anything that's kept me uh, in a job since uh, I've been I've been at this. Uh, for a job since I was 13 years old. And, and probably the main reason that I've gotten to work all this time is that I really never wanted a solo. <laughs> I'm a rhythm <laughs> player pretty much, you know, I, I would, as my buddies were, were learning to jam, I would sit and play E minor and a, uh, for three hours while they went up the neck in search of something. And, uh, and they're, Hey, I like that guy. He doesn't want a solo. He'll just, he'll just play <laughs> rhythm forever. <laughs> So, you know, that's my advice to anybody. If you want to be in a band, be okay playing rhythm and, and you can work forever. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, my primary guitar with Jimmy is a, is a Slothead D28 Martin from probably from the middle 70s because I, I had a Brazilian D35 that got stolen. And and I just picked up uh, this, this 28 middle 70s uh, Martin uh, on the road and it, it's over the years it's had kind of every pickup system that's ever been invented uh in it at least once and it's so so it's sort of a a little bit frankensteiny at this point but uh that that's my main guitar I like the wide necks of the slothead martins and uh I've got a I've got a McPherson 12 string that's an awesome guitar out on the road and uh 
a, a Schecter strap that Herschel had at the NAM show in the seventies that, that I've been carrying around forever. It's just a beautiful piece of Koa. Um, and then I'll take a utility. Sometimes it's a baritone Jerry Jones or sometimes a Gretsch or I'm, I'm usually, if I play electric, I'm usually trying to put it between two other guys who are also playing electric. So it's, sometimes it's a Gretsch or a 12 string or a baritone. You know, I'm, I'm kind of the utility man got that it. way. But, and I've got a, I've got a, a Fletcher Brock, uh, octave mandolin that, uh, that's been out on the road with us the last couple of years. And, a and a Jim Triggs uh, mandola that, that that comes out with us as well. You know, we're always looking for different different color, different texture. Yeah, yeah. I just saw Fletcher. I, we were just talking about him. I, I interviewed Sarah DeRose, and uh, obviously she's got the Fletcher Brock too. So, yeah. Yes, she does. As a matter of fact, uh, it was it was through Sarah that I, that I discovered that instrument. I, I was impressed with hers and, and got the info and talked to Fletcher and uh, – and uh, actually, I'll, I'll probably leapfrogging a little bit, but the, the track that, uh, that that we're about to put out, the, the little my little arrangement of Norwegian Wood, is pretty much because of that instrument. Uh, that's that's all that's on it is is a percussion and and that octave mandolin is is the only thing that's on that record. You you can't uh, see the piece of paper with my <laughs> questions, but I had that exact question down at the bottom because <laughs> I it's such a distinctive sound, and I was trying to figure out. I was racking my brain like, what is that? A nylon string guitar? And so, okay, now we know. No, it's it's Fletcher's uh, octave mandolin, and. Uh, you you may or may not uh, identify with this, Jason, but. You know, when you have a certain number of instruments in your house and you decide to get another one, uh, there's there. I don't, I don't want to say there's an element of guilt, but the way that I was raised, I want to do something to, to justify that instrument, you know, it, not necessarily to make it pay for itself, but I, I want to spend some time with it. I want, I want it to light me up in some way. And that's such a wonderful instrument. And, and one of the first things that happened to me before I wrote anything on it was I came up with this little arrangement of Norwegian Wood. And I went, hey, that's, I never thought of that song that way. And I sing it. I'm a baritone. I don't really have any business singing high, but I end up singing that song a fourth above where John Lennon sang it. Uh, he did it in D and I, I think, and I do it in G up in the, with that mandolin, but it just hits it in a cool place. Uh, and and plus, you know, I, I, like I don't have anybody I've got to go justify the purchase of Fletcher's mandolin to, but, <laughs> but, but somewhere inside of me, there's like you need to do something with this <laughs> that's that's unique to this. And and uh, the, the it, it, plus, once you're 35, any way that you can trick yourself into being inspired is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, uh, I've always said that from a songwriting standpoint. All the all the stuff that was welled up inside you and bursting to get out is probably out at about mid thirty. So you have to go, you have to dig a little deeper. That's your cut off. Okay. I didn't obviously. No, I was going to say you you have to dig a little bit deeper after after the initial burst of creativity that people have up to their thirty or so. Yeah. And, well, uh, uh, and obviously I didn't write Norwegian Wood, but but finding a new way to play it uh, counts at this point in time. I, I I have a lot of fun. I look forward to playing that song every time we get to play it yeah no you did a great job the, the album it, we'll get to the album it's once in a lifetime it's incredible but i i uh you you mentioned a few times now and you're very humble so you're you're probably the last person to admit that you've won like every cma music, musician of the year that you could and all that good stuff but you were a professional musician at 13 uh yes my, my mom was a gospel piano player and uh so i was always at church with her uh, and then for, when, when I was 13, I played, I played piano, uh, the, the first several bands I played in, I was a piano player and this guy came to our house. I lived in a dry County in Mississippi. So there were no, it was like footloose. There was no, it was illegal to dance and there were no <laughs> bars okay. and you couldn't buy a beer and you had to go, someone wanted to dance or, or drink a beer. They had to go across the state line. Uh, in Tennessee, or they had to drive at least an hour in any direction in Mississippi, where I grew up. And this this guy came to my parents' house and solicited them to to let me be the piano player in his band. That, which oddly enough was called Dean and the Reapers, was the name of this guy's band. Wow. 
Uh, and my parents had never been in a bar and, and they, they were not, I don't want to say strict religious, but they were just really straight, wonderful people. But I imagine they were about to throw this guy off the porch for even suggesting that their underage son go play in a honky tonk at iron city, Tennessee at the state line. But, uh, but he made a presentation that he was a good Christian man and that he would look after me and, uh, and, and he would pay me $250 a week at 13 years old, which was at that time more than my dad was making teaching school, uh, and more than my mom was making working at the Wrangler factory. And she never charged for playing music. She was a church piano player. So I don't think she ever charged anybody. So, Somewhere in his presentation, something appealed to them. <laughs> Probably the fact that they were going to get to keep most of that two hundred fifty bucks. Sure. But, uh, but at any rate, that that Friday night, I was I was playing piano in a honky tonk, and I did that for a couple of years, and and that introduced me to the session players in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. We we were going through Muscle Shoals to get to this place, so I ended up meeting some of the Muscle Shoals rhythm section guys and there's, you know, there were half a dozen studios all had their own rhythm section in Muscle Shoals. And, uh, I started working there in the studios at about 15. So still on piano. I'm 62 now. No, uh, no. Th- then it was, it was acoustic guitar and that came about because I was so underage. I, th- and these were really rough honky tonks. I mean, there were people with chainsaws inside the building that were <laughs> revving them up instead of applauding them. Uh, I mean, thankfully nobody killed me, but, but but they were rough. And I, so I was really afraid to get off stage and I would take my little, I had a little Yamaha acoustic guitar and I would, I would take that up there. And when we took a break, I would just sit down behind the piano and practice acoustic guitar because I was basically scared to get off the stage in this place that we were playing. And so some of the musicians would come up and listen. And at that time there wasn't a dedicated acoustic player in Muscle Shoals. There were some great guitar players. Obviously, Dwayne Allman had been there, and Pete Carr was there. and I mean, tons of great guitar players, but there wasn't really a dedicated acoustic player. So they, you know, at some point, they said, you want to come play some acoustic guitar with us? And I started doing that. And and sort of, it sort of became the acoustic guy in Muscle Shoals, which, which uh, was really a blessing because... I don't know how much you know about the Muscle Shoals hierarchy yeah. there, but everybody, they were sort of insulated. Everybody had their own rhythm section. If you played at Fame, you didn't really go play at Muscle Shoals Sound very much, or you played at Wishbone, you didn't really go play at Broadway. But because because there wasn't a dedicated acoustic player, I got to cross-pollinate. I got to go play with the Muscle Shoals Sound guys, and I got to play at Fame, and I got to play at Wishbone. And, uh, and, and consequently... I learned from a lot of great, great producers. You know, Rick Hall was at Fame, and uh, Woodford and Ivy were at Wishbone, and, and Barry Beckett and Jerry Wexler were working in Muscle Shoals Sound. And, uh, you know, I, I got to sit at the feet of some amazing record makers. And I wouldn't say at all that I'm particularly talented or particularly intelligent, but just the fact that I was around all of that, if you pick up a little bit, you're going to end up seeming, you know, like you know what you're doing a little, you know, to some degree. Sure. What, what were some of those sessions? Are have any endured and become classic sessions that you are in? Uh, well, you know the the, the 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 real heyday. You know the Paul Simon and uh, you know we most of what we what I played on at Fame was was country stuff. Jerry Reed and Mac Mac Davis and uh, the and uh, you know the Shenandoah Billy Joe Royal. I, I'll forget I'll forget stuff. Uh, Vern Gosden. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of country stuff and we we did Roy Orbison at uh, at Wishbone I really enjoyed working with him but uh and a few projects with Wexler and then from that I ended up getting a record deal at uh at like 19 years old and my stuff is sort of finger picking short stories mashed into songs it's kind of what what I was doing then I I didn't even have the nerve to call it songwriting i just knew i was staying up later than my parents <laughs> and mumbling over a guitar <laughs> but, uh, you're still living with your parents through th- this whole time <laughs> no I, I, I at that time i was yeah sure uh, wow and did you tell them about and, these honky tonks where the guys were running their chainsaws 
Did they know how, how dire just, it was? They just said, you know, we, 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 we trust you to behave yourself. And, uh, and I couldn't drive. So I was being driven and brought home every night. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but, but they are like, you know, we feel like we raised you right. Go up there and behave yourself. And, and I think the fact that they put faith in me made me, uh, made me behave myself a lot more than I would have probably otherwise. And, yeah. uh, I, I give them credit for, for putting some faith in me and, and, and they certainly influenced how I have gone about the business of parenting because it, it, it meant a lot to me that, that they trusted me to, to behave myself. Sure. And, um, but, but they would, they would have been horrified at some of the stuff that I've seen. <laughs> you know, there's no question about that. Yeah. But it ended up manifesting into songs. So, uh, you know, that's a lot of that stuff became the songs on my first two or three albums. So it, it all worked out. Yeah. And, and going back to the, you know, 1977, that first album, who were your big influences back then? Were there songwriters that you were so into that you, you kind of got the bug? Oh yeah. Uh, you know, from a, from a recording arrangement standpoint, I was a Beatle fanatic, uh, it, cause they invented so many recording arranging techniques for, for record making. But, uh, but as a songwriter, uh, it was, it was Randy Newman, John Prime, uh, uh, Steve Goodman, Jimmy Buffett. Uh, you know, I was a fan of J Jimmy came from Mississippi. So it, it, he was sort of a role model to us Mississippi guys who were trying to do it. Uh, and certainly the, for me anyway, the, the literary guys from Mississippi, the William Faulkner and, and Eudora wealthy and Tennessee Williams, the, the, those guys, uh, and, and, and lady came, came from my part of the country and, and actually my part of the state. So, uh, what they were doing with words uh, was a strong influence. I, I probably would have been a lame prose writer, although that, I, I aspired to do that. But if I took if I took what would have been a an average short story and mashed it down into three minutes, it it sort of condensed into a reduction sauce that seemed a little more impressive, you know, <laughs> as a song than it, it was as a short story. It's a great uh, way to put it. Well, thank you. But, uh, you know, and I, I, that wasn't something I probably did on, on purpose or, or by design. It's just how it ended up working for me. Yeah. So when, uh, after Muscle Shoals and, and home, was Nashville the next obvious stop? Well, the, I, I had actually a pop record deal, but I have this accent that you're still hearing today. That's uh, not a lot different than it was <laughs> at the time. And, uh, and I've, I've always liked all kinds of music. So pe people started hiring me to come to Nashville and play, play acoustic guitar some. And, and some of the songs that I was writing, I, the, 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 I, I got a couple of, the first session, the first union session I ever played on in Muscle Shoals was a Hank Williams Jr. album, and, and Hank re ended up recording a couple of songs that that I wrote, and that was sort of an intro, I guess, to Nashville as well. Uh, and in my first album, there were enough people that liked my first album. It, it's quirky songwriting, I guess, that they started bringing me up, and it's only two two hours and fifteen minutes from Muscle Shoals to Nashville, so huh. I, I started coming up in '78 and. And playing some in studios, and, and occasionally writing a song for somebody, and uh, and did that. You know, I ended up, you know, eventually being asked to produce some records and and, and wrote some hit songs for for some of the country artists, and, and that, that which is obviously a great supplement to a, a session player's income, and uh, certainly a an esoteric singer songwriter's income can get supplemented by writing a hit for somebody else. <laughs> And, uh, so, and as I began to have kids, I didn't really want to go on the road as much for a while there. And, and so between Muscle Shells and Nashville, the, the session life and the songwriting publishing life be became more of the deal for me. And we, we moved, I still, my studio is still in Muscle Shells. I, the, the little live streaming thing we're doing is from my studio in Muscle Shells. That's wow. going to happen tonight. Yeah. So, but, uh, but uh, 
we, we moved the family up to Nashville in 93. And uh, because I was working up here so much, I, it was just more practical to get to see the kids, you know, at, at the end of the day. Uh, and and Nashville's always been very accepting of me. And uh, I am a small town guy at heart. So when I first moved, I, I knew I liked working up here, but I didn't know if I was going to be comfortable riding here because I am such a small town creature. So I kept the I kept the place in Muscle Shoals to sort of be my creative uh, center of the compass or whatever you say. It, that's that's still musical home for me is my my place on the river in Muscle Shoals. But uh, but because I have that it allows me to feel good about wherever I am. I, I don't, I can write a song anywhere if I know that's there, you know, yeah. does that make any kind of sense? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would probably be, I'm so superstitious about, I don't really understand a lot about the process. I would, if, if I didn't have that place, I would, I'd probably be concerned that, that I might be finished writing songs. So it's nice for me to have as a, it's, it's sort of my musical security blanket, that place. Is it a, is it a, I'm, pic, I'm picturing like a man cave, but is this an actual house that you've just got a recording studio in? It was the family house. It's okay. on the bluffs down there. I, I can literally throw a rock and hit the old muscle shell sound or the, 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 the last muscle shell sound, which was down on the river. Uh, I, I can hit the roof of that from my porch. <laughs> that would be a bad neighbor, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it's very close to that. And it's an old hundred year old house, which sort of has its own stories and uh, all of that. Uh, all of that is my kind of deal. It, it's a man cave now because it's just been me going there. My my kids still like to go and horse horse around down there. But where there used to be a dining table, there's a neat console, and uh, we call it the fancy eating table. You know, like the Beverly Hillbillies. Sure. <laughs> uh, and and there's there's a guitar within reach of every chair in the house and there's mic lines run all over the place and it's just a good sounding old house so we we cut a lot of Jimmy's records there and a lot of a lot of the Sawyer Brown records that I produced uh and the Crystal Dew records that I produced and my, most of my records this this new record was almost entirely cut down there we cut one thing at Jimmy's studio as well it's incredible oh, sorry I'm stop phone ringing here just a yeah. Uh, but uh and that's called, that my studio is called la la land uh, and it's it's essentially although it is a cool old house it's sort of like uh, you probably remember when we were in junior high school we, we guys tend to make a, a little fort somewhere that might be in the woods or sure. that you can just you can say you can you can make the call who gets to come and who doesn't get to come and uh <laughs> That's kind of what this is. It's, I am basically 11 years old, <laughs> and, and and I'm really happy to be getting away with you know in my sixth decade of being on Earth. That's amazing. It's so cool that you have that. Uh, does this superstition that you talk about extend to your musical instruments too? I know you're still playing the same slothead Martin uh, even on the road when a lot of people would retire oh, a yeah. guitar like that. Yeah, it does. It's been broken so many times. It's uh, it's not stable anymore. The heads, the actually, the headstock's been broken off of it three different times. So it's not remotely viable. Except <laughs> Guitar techs works. must hate you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not not the most popular with that. I'm not to the point of Willie and Trigger. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have Willie Nelson and Trigger out there at, at running point for that particular scenario where you try to keep an old guitar alive. Because my my slot head would be would be not too far behind Willie and his, his trigger, you know, but, uh, but that's I, the guitar. I, I am grateful that they keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah, that it is. And, and I'm, because I'm honestly, I, I, I'm not probably the biggest fan of my playing, but, but as a songwriter, I've always felt like guitars have songs in them. Certain, certain, you know, the, whatever it's a wood combination or I pick up and it doesn't have to be necessarily an awesome. I'm not really a guitar collector, but over the years I pick up a guitar and I hit a chord and I'm like, that's got, that's got stories in it. And, and that's the reason that I have them. Uh, you know, as a, as a session player, there's certain things that I want, you know, in the same way that a painter would have a palette with, you know, you, you want an old Gibson with dead strings. You want a 12 string, you want a gut string, you want, 
but uh, but more than that for me, it, if they if they tickle some part of my brain and make me think there's a story in there that's not going to be that hard for me to coax out, that's really what I want out of a guitar. Uh, and and are you and, uh, and are you are you songwriting all the time? Do you have a process there or routine? Uh, yeah, I have a terrible process. As a matter of fact, I, I am, I would be pretty much the don'ts of songwriting. <laughs> <That's serious. laughs> you know, my, my friends in Nashville that, that, uh, that are, that are the best are, are very scientific in that they go to work every day and they get, they, they have a method and they book appointments and they're going to write songs. And, and I have always, I, I like I said, I'm a little superstitious and a little bit precious and I don't really understand the process, but I've always wanted to feel like it was, it was because of inspiration that I wrote a song. I never wanted to write because I put the word songwriter on a loan application or, or a tax return and, and felt obligated to, to justify that. I, I want, so I pretty much schedule my life like I'm not a songwriter and then songs occasionally kind of wrestle me to the ground and take over my schedule against my will. Uh, okay. That's kind of what happens. All right. um, and, and, and because it happens that way, I never question if it was inspired because I wasn't trying to do it. <laughs> I was, I was trying to take out the garbage or trying to, you know, play a session or cut the grass or whatever it is that regular life is. And this song usurped my schedule and and demanded to be attended to and and I love that I mean I, I, everybody loves getting out of cutting the grass but that's one of the best reasons to get out of cutting the grass you know that's because this song had to be written and, and I was the guy that day you know it's magical and I I like to think that some of the way that I feel about that ends up ends up recorded you know it ends up whether whether my contribution to a record is just me playing along like a George Strait record or a Keith Whitley record or or you know some of the stuff that I've gotten to do over the years I've, I've been, and I don't want to leave anybody out because I'm so lucky to to do every session I do but if I'm playing guitar or if I'm singing harmony or if I wrote a song or producing or whatever or if I'm going to buy cheeseburgers for the people that are better than me that are going to do it instead of me any any contribution I feel magical about the process of, of being close to music being made and trying to make it better than it would have been if I wasn't there. Uh, and, and I try with, with my God given limitations to make that happen. And it, it makes me pumped about every single day. And I've always said that I, I think, I think joy gets recorded just as loud as flat and sharp and ahead of the beat or behind the beat, mm. all the things that are negative get recorded. But I think, I think enjoying, I think joy in music, the joyful noise thing, like the Bible says that gets recorded too, you know? And, and that's one of the things that, that makes music so special. It's, you know, there aren't many things in the world that can turn bad into good and, and music can do that. Whatever, whatever bad experience, I had can turn into a good song that, that becomes a shared experience that somebody else maybe went through the same thing and they hear the song and we have a bond then after that. And that's, that's turning bad into good. There, there are not half a dozen things that I know of in the world that can do that. Yeah. When, uh, when inspiration hits, when you are mowing the lawn, uh, does the, uh, does the song, come out pretty fully formed or do you wrestle with it for a while after you get that initial thought down on paper? It's, it's happened all kinds of ways. Uh, but, but the first, probably the first half dozen songs for me just literally fell out. Like, like I'd learned them out of a book. Oh, wow. it, it had no, it had nothing to do with writing. It was just literally, I played a, a D minor chord and sang a song like, like I'd always known it. And I was like, wow, that must be how people write songs because I had no idea how people write songs. And and I had three or four happen like that. And and then I sat around a couple of years and nothing happened. And I said, well, maybe some people have to work at it a little bit. You know? yeah. and, uh, and and so I'd piddle with the guitar and, and 
I've tried all kinds of ways, and there and there's been songs that took me a year uh, to get happy with, and and the, and there's one that took me over a decade to get happy with. I'm also relentless. Once I feel like it's my song to write, I won't turn loose. I won't quit. You know, if it's not easy to write, I'll still go hard if if we have to. But because that initial thing was an inspiration, it, it makes me know that, that it's mine. You know, you, does that make any sense? Of you know, yeah. that, uh, the, the, and I take it, I mean, I take it as a blessing, but I also take it as a responsibility. It's my job to make this song be what it's, what it can be, be the best I can make it. So, so I probably, not as many fall right out of my mouth these days as used to, because like I said, most of that weld up stuff happens pretty early on. But, uh, and after you have a catalog, an existing catalog, you end up having to sort of tap dance through the minefield of what you've done before mm. <laughs> to try to do something different or not plagiarize yourself. You know? Yeah. You've written songs for some some of the biggest names in music. And I'm, I'm curious for those of us like myself who don't live in the 615 area code of Nashville, what, what is the process like of shopping songs around? Is this all word of mouth people you've met through, you know, nights at the bluebird cafe or whatever, or are there songs of yours that are just floating around looking for a home with a big name star? Well, uh, Early on, there were a couple of folks that, you know, that liked the way I played guitar and they ended up getting an album and they would go cut an album song. I'm not, I'm a terrible networker and I'm not a self promoter at all. Mm -hmm. But, uh, the, and initially it was people finding songs that were album cuts on my record. And then beyond that, uh, that I I would write a song and then go demo it and, and like, uh, the, for instance, the song uh, "Old Flame" for Alabama. Mm-hmm. That's still probably maybe the biggest copyright in my catalog. I wrote that with a friend of mine from Muscle Shoals, Donnie Lowry. But we wrote that song and demoed it, and and they they cut the song. That was my first number one that we ever had uh, as writers. But then, but then they also said, "Who's who's playing on that? I want I want who's playing on that to get you know to come and play," and. So, so the work sort of spreads out in all directions. You know, if you if you play or, or arrange in a good way on a demo, that 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 in, that turns into a master session. Hmm. And if somebody hires you for a master session, and somebody else says, "Hey, you know, he wrote that song for Alabama." Oh yeah, well, you got anything for me? And, and that that sort of I'm a terrible uh, self promoter, like I said, but the fact that I was there. And somebody asked me allowed allowed an avenue for for a really bashful kid from a small town <laughs> to, to to survive because I, I I could never have I I never had enough uh, hood spot to go and say you should listen to me or listen to my stuff I I can't I never asked anybody that uh, the the way that I got a record deal was I was playing acoustic guitar on a session for an artist that didn't show up and we had, so we had a rhythm section and a studio and, and they said, well, we got a band here. Let's cut a track. Who's got a song. And they went around the rhythm section. You got a song? No. And, and I said, no, about three times. And it just kept going around. And, and the engineer had, I played in a band with, and he points at me and he goes, this guy over here, he's just bashful. I know he writes songs. <laughs> and they said, well, play us a song. And they, they finally talked me into playing a song and they went, geez, we'll just cut a record on you. Wow. And that was that. That was that self-titled uh, you know, record? I never went. Uh, that was a self-titled record. And the song that I played him was called It's a Crazy World, which was yeah. a was a top 40 pop single. And I think it went to, you know, somewhere in the top 10 of what was then the easy listening chart. And it's just a sort of James Taylor-y finger-picking story song that I wrote when I was 16. And uh, I, I, so I never went anywhere. I never even played those songs for my parents, and I had a record deal. Uh, Amazing. So, like I said, I'm the don'ts of how you go about this. Yeah, <laughs> hey, whatever uh, works. But but I also yeah, and but but it works in a good way for me because if like if I had become an overnight sensation when I was 19 years old, I would be 
in past tense at this point. And somehow or other, I'm in my 60s and I still get to do it. You know, I, I, I get to play on other people's records. I get to go with with some of my best friends in the world and, and make records at a high level and play tours at a high level. And I can go play my my small venue singer songwriter shows in the cracks of time of that. And, and I can go be a guitar player or a background singer in, in the cracks of that time. So I still get to go at music in so many different ways. Uh, it's, it's honestly, it's ideal for me. I wouldn't want to trade places with anybody. And yeah. this record that I just made, yeah. you know, a, a lot of people make a record because they have a tour that's booked and they have a staff that, and, a, and, and a, a payroll that they have to meet. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the only reason I ever make a record is is because I think I've ended up with uh, 10 or so, 10 or in this case, 12 things that I'd like to say. And and that's the only reason I make a record, uh, which is uh, I, I kind of a luxury. Yeah. Uh, when did you record Once in a Lifetime, the new record? Uh, there's, there's a couple of tracks that were, that were, that are sort of glorified demos that I started a couple of years ago, but, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's been recorded down in La La Land, all, all but like three tracks and my show, uh, my concert these days is just myself and Eric Darkin on percussion. He's, he's the percussionist in the Coral Reefer band as well. And an old session buddy of mine and. We he sets up a, a sort of a makeshift kit out of suitcases and pots and pans, and auto parts, and, <laughs> and and I carry you know four or five guitars or mandolins and and we can make a pretty good bit of noise for two guys. And that, but the, the the core of the record is is just he and I. There's there's one song that the Coral Reefer band played on, and there's one song that I cut as sort of a country demo that's got a full rhythm section on it. But for the most part, it's just Eric and myself, and. And it was it was cut, I guess, starting around June of last year. Okay. And uh, uh, it w- w- would you say there's a theme to these songs? I know there's kind of a of a home home theme, kind of, I guess. But well, w- w- how would you describe it? Well, th- there, there's a rural aspect to a lot of because I I kind of see the world through a small community. Uh, optic prism whatever vantage point uh and so that there's always going to be that aspect to, to, to what i am doing but but basically uh what happened between my last record and this record i, I had I, I i had a a big the big bang heart attack the widowmaker thing and uh-huh. uh and al- almost left the world and i've always been somebody that appreciates being here but uh but I, I I appreciate it more. I consider myself in the bonus round at this point. You know, yeah. the, the the men in my family tend to live till about 60 years old and just kind of drop in the yard <laughs> out of courtesy. We don't want to be trouble to anybody, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and that happened to me when I was 60. I had, I had the big heart attack, but, but I made it to the hospital and they saved my life. And I get to, I get to be around a little while longer and see my kids a little while longer. And so a guy who was already really grateful for every day got a lot more grateful for every day. And I, I think probably more than anything else, that's, that's the abiding thing about, or that, that would be the, the, the biggest characteristic of once in a lifetime is, is that every day really is once in a lifetime. And, and, and I know it better than I used to know it because of, you know, because of my last few years of life. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, you've got a live stream happening later today. Are you going to do more of those? Yes. Is that the new, is that the new regime now with the pandemic? We, we well, I would say we're going to be doing some of that with, uh, with Jimmy and the coral reefers because he, he, he can't stand not to play. He's never gone this long without playing in his oh, adult God. life. So <laughs> fortunately we made the record and he had that to do, but, uh, he's, he's never not toured. So he's, he's, chomping at the bit to get going. Uh, and I, you know, I'm sure we'll do some more, but in, in my case, I'm, I, I'm, I play every day anyway. You know, if, 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 if nobody wants to hear me, I totally understand that. 
I don't even know that I don't agree with them, but I'm going to play. I'm going to, I'm going to try to make something up, and I'm going to try to figure out how to play something I couldn't play yesterday. I want to get better, you know. And uh, so, you know, if I love performing, I love getting to be on stage, and and I miss that, and I look forward to getting on on it again. And the couple of live stream things that we've done requires a little getting used to play into a, an audience you can't see or hear, you know. Uh, it, it, but but I'm a pretty personal guy, so the, I, I still I still feel a personal connection with whoever's on the other end of the of the stream. So uh, if if that's the way we do it for a while, I'm I'm going to be really happy to get to do it. Yeah, and uh, let's let's go back to the gear. We talked about the old Martin. There, I've seen pictures of you with an old Gibson too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've got I've got a few. Uh, yeah, uh, I've, I've got a '51 uh, J1 or 185 uh-huh. that that, was... uh, that I've actually never changed the strings on, and I've had it for almost 30 years. Uh, <laughs> you were you weren't and, kidding about the Gibson with the dead strings? Oh no, that's a deal. That is a serious deal. <laughs> uh, and and uh, Jimmy and I have uh, actually, we actually have the only two of these I've ever seen. Uh, the old. Uh, the 1939 uh, stair step headstock J100. That's it's the same same body as the 200. Uh, it was sort of the it was sort of the less expensive model, but those are phenomenal guitars. There's not very many of them. But he, I think uh, I think we put a picture of our, our twins of those on on his album booklet. That's uh, that's one of the best recording guitars I've ever come in contact with, and. Uh, and I, I, I've got a, a slot head, one of the new the Martin Sinkers, the the Quad O uh, 18S, and that's that's a brand new guitar made. Uh, you've seen those that are made out of the ancient mahogany. That yeah, they pulled up out of the river down in Belize. Uh, Jimmy got a couple of those. I I, I got Vince Gill sort of turned me on to them, but uh, th- those things are phenomenal. I, that's I've been playing that really more than anything here lately. The, the little Quado 18 slot head. That's a monster. Nice. And uh, final question, I guess, is uh, you mentioned Sarah and, and Sarah DeRose influencing you to get a, a Fletcher Brock. What other of the younger singer-songwriters out there are you kind of listening to these days? Who's really inspiring you? Well, uh, you know, it's it's going to sound like I'm just being a regional bro, but... but uh, I, I think I think Jason Isbell is maybe the best lyricist that's that's working in music today, and, yeah. and he just happens to be from the Muscle Shoals area there as well. So I I really really root for Jason, you know, and 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 I'm inspired by him. I, you know, it, I don't root for him like a dad or anything, even though I, I I first heard his stuff when he was about thirteen or fourteen. But he's awesome, and uh, and and he's he's got some of that that thing between John Prine and Dylan uh, in, in what he's doing now for a new generation. So I, I really, he, he keeps me excited and he keeps me on my toes, you know, cause uh, it, it's nice to know somebody's working. So it, it's easy to be from one generation and say these kids today, you know, but these kids today are good <laughs> and, and it's inspiring. Have your paths <laughs> makes, crossed? Makes, Have makes, you met him? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. Yeah. No, we, we we've gotten to work together and he's uh he he's been awfully gracious to me. We we've gotten to play together several times and uh he he did a residency last year at the uh uh or it was year before last, right after my heart attack, but I, but I, I, he asked me to come play with him at the Hall of Fame Museum up there. We did uh uh I went blank for a sec, but Gillian Welsh, uh Gillian Welsh Amy Lou Harris, myself, and Jerry Douglas. We did a little night with Jason playing all his songs up there. He's he's awesome. Yeah, not a bad lineup there. <laughs> yeah, any uh, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of me, but any chain that I'm the weak link of is not bad. <laughs> Boy, Mac, you got them all. Uh, again, the records once in a lifetime. I I really thoroughly loved it, and uh, you you answered my my most probing question, what the heck was on that Norwegian wood right out of the gate? So uh, (laughs) we had plenty of other stuff to talk (laughs) about though. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jason. I I really, I I appreciate the help. Like I said, I'm, 
I'm a pretty poor self-promoter, so any help I get from outside is very much appreciated. Oh, no. any help we can do, you know where to find us. Thank you, Mac. Thanks so much.